This is Concept 2 Notes, and we're going to be talking through the geochemical cycles, also known as the nutrient cycles. I just want you to be familiar with both of those terms in case you're watching videos or reading in a textbook and you kind of see those. Sometimes they may even say biogeochemical cycles. So just know we're kind of all talking about the same thing here. And um, these notes are the same for CP and honors. So just to be aware, the video you're watching is applicable for CP and honors students. So, geochemical cycles. They represent the movement of matter, um, or of a particular form of matter, through the living and non-living parts of an ecosystem. Because remember, in terms of ecological organization, community is all the living things in a defined area. Ecosystem is all the living and non-living parts of that area. So we're looking at an ecosystem here. We're looking at both parts. We are going to look at three main cycles. Um, we're going to look at the water cycle, also known as the hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. Now, um, honor students especially, if you think back way back to unit one, chemistry of life, um, which was concept two, we talked about the six elements that are re really essential for life are um, hydrogen and oxygen, which are in water, carbon and nitrogen, and then phosphorus and sulfur. We're not going to talk through the phosphorus cycle or like a sulfur cycle because um, they're just not as, um, I mean, they're important. I don't want to say they're not as important, but these are definitely the three main ones. And a lot of um, molecules that have nitrogen in them also have phosphorus and sulfur. So when nitrogen is cycling, there is some cycling of phosphorus and sulfur. So we're just going to zoom in on these three main ones, even though there are others. I just want to warn you, especially if you watch some videos or read in your textbook, I'm not trying to cheat you out of information. I'm just trying to only narrow in and focus in on what we're going to talk about. So, if you think way back to physical science, since matter can never be created or destroyed, that's according to the law of conservation of um, mass, and Earth is a closed system, uh, meaning there's nothing being added or subtracted from it entirely, then these essential nutrients must be continuously cycling um, in order for life to function. So we're going to talk through each one. In class, we're going to go through one cycle, and then we'll do some activities um, for each one. So first is the water cycle. <clears throat> the chemical formula for water is H2O, and this is necessary for the life processes of all living things. Something very interesting about the water cycle is it stays water. It stays H2O throughout the cycle, so it doesn't change chemically. It's just changing um, and maybe the physical form. You know, the state may change. It may be a solid as ice, it may be a gas as water vapor, or maybe liquid, but it's still H2O the entire time. Water is found um, in the Earth's surface. It's in oceans, lakes, rivers, puddles, all those things. 97% is in the ocean, um, which is kind of crazy. And of the 3% that is fresh water, because the ocean's salt water, 2% of that is frozen in glaciers. Um, so really, we only have access to like 1% of fresh water, which is kind of crazy. And then there's water under the Earth's surface and groundwater. Um, aquifers are when water um, kind of builds up underground. Also in the atmosphere is water vapor. If you live in the low country, um, like I do, and um, like my students do, there is a we can feel that water in the atmosphere because it is so humid down here. There's also water in living organisms. Um, you know, a lot of you, especially if you're like a wrestler, you know you've got a lot of water weight that you can shed really easily. So we find water in all these things. So the water cycle is driven by the sun. Without the sun, it's not going to be able to happen because the sun is causing evaporation. It's, a, it's causing water to return to the atmosphere, which is really um, important. So... We're going to kind of talk through six um, main steps of the water cycle. So first is precipitation, which we see right here. That's water falling from the sky. So it's going to be rain, sleet, snow, something like that. Runoff is when liquid water isn't absorbed in the ground. And so it kind of runs along or runs off the surface. Um, so it could run down. So we see right here it's kind of running down this mountain. Or you could see, we see it kind of right here in the surface runoff. It's running down this grass into this river. Okay, so um, we see runoff on pavement on the side of the roads um, when it rains. So runoff is any time it's not being absorbed. 
Infiltration is the opposite. That's when the water actually is going underground and it can build up underground in aquifers. That's when it's absorbed by the ground. So either going to run off or it's going to infiltrate. Evaporation is when the sun heats liquid water um, and it becomes water vapor and it rises to the atmosphere from a body of water. Transpiration is similar but different. This is when water rises back to the atmosphere, but it's coming off of plants, not a body of water. And then last but not least, all that water vapor, when it is in the atmosphere, condenses to form clouds, and then those will eventually cause precipitation again. So there's no starting or stopping or beginning or end. It's all a continuous cycle, and it can all be happening all at once. Something really important for each of these cycles, we're going to talk through the living organisms that are a part of the cycle, as well as human impact on each cycle. So first, all organisms are taking in water for nutrient transport, for chemical reactions, for diffusion, all these different things. And we're all eliminating water by peeing and pooping. We're also releasing water when we break down food for energy. If you remember when we learned about cellular respiration, water is a product of that as you can see here. And plants are taking in water to make sugar in photosynthesis, as you can see here. Now, you may be saying, well, why isn't diffusion, why isn't cellular respiration, why isn't photosynthesis a step in the water cycle? They all contribute to the water cycle, but they're just not big enough steps to, I mean, we could add in and say there's like 12 steps in the water cycle, but we're simplifying it down to six main steps. And then these other ones are really small minor steps. So they're important, but they're not as part of the six main steps. Now, what about human participation in the water cycle? How do we contribute to the cycle? How do we negatively impact the cycle? I want you to pause and think about that. And now I want to tell you, so first deforestation, as we cut down trees, that's going to decrease transpiration because there'll be less trees to return water to the atmosphere. Also paving and building and developing, that's going to increase runoff and decrease infiltration because pavement can't absorb water. Also pollution, you know, that's going to have a negative impact um, by messing up the water and can create acid rain, which is never a good thing. All right, that's the water cycle. Now let's talk about the carbon cycle. Carbon is another one of the mol um, or the elements that is necessary for life to exist. It's a part of a bunch of molecules that you need. It is found in macromolecules, every macromolecule that we learned about, carbs, proteins, lipids, um, nucleic acids. All of those have carbon in them. And remember all those different things that they're a part of. Carbon's also in our atmosphere as CO2. It's in minerals and rocks. It's in fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. It's um, a part of the um, kind of like living part of soils and aquatic sediments. So it's in so many things. And what's important to note is carbon changes forms as it cycles, unlike water. Water is always H2O chemically the entire time, whereas carbon is changing. You know, in the atmosphere, it's CO2. In plants, as glucose, it's C6H12O6. So it's chemically, it's going to be in different forms as it cycles. All right, this picture isn't as great because I had to find um, free for commercial use images. So bear with me. I'll draw a better picture on the board as we learn about this. But the main stages, we're going to narrow this one down to six steps too. Some things will show you more than that, but we're going to narrow it down to six. Photosynthesis first. Plants capture CO2 from the atmosphere and they use it to make sugar. Cellular respiration is going to be the opposite of that. CO2 is released into the atmosphere as waste um, through metabolism as we learned in concept one as organisms are consuming food for energy and then producing waste. Consumption. One organism eats, an eats another for energy and we're taking in carbon in the form of macromolecules in those organisms. So we're consuming them. Combustion is anytime um, CO2 is released into the atmosphere, anytime something's burned. Um, you may remember from physical science, we learned combustion reactions are always something reacting with oxygen and creating carbon dioxide and water. So it's just always a product of burning. All right, now decomposition, you can kind of tie this with elimination. So elimination, some people include as a step. That's when you basically pee or poop to, or technically um, your dead body. If you die, um, you're being eliminated. And then decomposers then will take down, take those eliminated sources and break them down and return that carbon to the soil that plants can then absorb in their roots. Now, if the, that carbon in the soil um, from once living organisms goes through intense heat and compression over millions of years, 
we can create foss, uh, fossil fuels from that. So like coal, oil, and natural gas, which those can then be burned as a fuel source. So that continues a cycle. All right, living organisms in the carbon cycle. So first we got decomposers like bacteria and fungi. They break down dead materials and return the nutrients like carbon to the soil. Photosynthetic organisms like plants and algae and even some bacteria, they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they can convert it to simple sugars. So animals and plants and fungi and just consumers in general who do cellular respiration um, can break down those carbon-rich foods for energy like our dolphin here. All right, what do you think about human participation in the carbon cycle? How do we contribute and what do you think is our biggest negative impact? So in terms of like just natural contribution, we're contributing through cellular respiration by, uh, or through consumption by eating, cellular respiration by releasing, um, technically elimination, even though that's not like an official step. But negatively, our biggest impact is combustion. Um, when wood or fossil fuels which contain carbon are burned, it creates major amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. And um, that is something we do alone. You know, bears aren't out there burning fossil fuels to power factories. Humans are the ones doing that. So we are the major contributor to combustion. And we'll talk more of that when we get to concept four about human impact on the environment. And then last, we got the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen is the last element, which is a part of many molecules um, necessary for life that we're going to focus on. It's found in two of the macromolecules, proteins and nucleic acids. It's found in the atmosphere in the form of a gas as N2. Um, N2 is referred to as elemental nitrogen or atmospheric nitrogen. But the thing is that's interesting is plants and animals can't use nitrogen that in this form. And so you'll see the nitrogen cycle, most of it is just taking in it too and converting it into usable forms for plants. Um, nitrogen is also in fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. Or, um, it's in waste too, in feces and urine and dead materials. And it's also in soil and aquatic sediments. So, main stages of the nitrogen cycle, there's a lot. And anytime you're going to like Google a picture of the nitrogen cycle, you'll see varying complexities of diagrams. So, um, just don't worry about what you're seeing. Sorry, I got tongue-tied for a second. Um, in case, if it's confusing, just don't worry about it. Just um, do your best, and I'll give you diagrams that you can understand. So first, nitrogen fixation. Um, bacteria or even lightning in the soil or water convert nitrogen from the air or water into um, forms that plants can use. Decomposition, decomposers like bacteria or fungus break down dead matter um, and they return nitrogen to the soil from dead things. Ammonification, that's when bacteria convert nitrogen from waste like urine and feces into ammonia specifically. Um, nitrification is bacteria going to convert nitrogen and ammonia into nitrates and nitrites, which is NO3 and NO2, um, in order to be absorbed by plants in their roots. This is usually the form in which that um, nitrogen enters the food chain and eventually reaches us because this is how plants tend to absorb it in their roots. And then denitrification is when bacteria convert nitrogen and ammonia and other sources like nitrates and nitrites back into N2 so it can go back into the atmosphere as we see here. Um, nitrogen cycle is really unique because no step is completed without the help of living organisms. Um, you know, there are steps in the other cycles that happen without living things, but this one can't happen without them. And bacteria is the MVP. Without bacteria, this cycle could not happen. And then fungi are, and other decomposers are also really important too, but bacteria is really number one. All right, what do you think about human participation? Um, our main negative effect is fertilizers. So fertilizers, if you ever go to like a Lowe's or a Home Depot and you look at fertilizers, they have, they're always advertising that they're nitrogen rich or nitrate rich or ammonia rich. They have tons of nitrogen in them. So fertilizers add way too much nitrogen to the soil, which creates an imbalance. And this excess nitrogen can get into groundwater, which can be dangerous to drink. Um, also combustion, this isn't a major part of the nitrogen cycle as much as it is the carbon cycle because nitrogen is in smaller amounts in fossil fuels. But burning fossil fuels does add nitrogen to the atmosphere. So that is something to consider also. And that's your geochemical cycles.